We move now to that first uh, panel discussion, the first of three, a chance to uh, dig a little deeper into some of the issues facing most, if not all, of the leaders joining us today. Uh, President Michel has joined uh, the others on the stage. I would also like to welcome three new guests joining uh, us virtually, two from the other side of the world. Um, we have Prime Minister Ardern of New Zealand, a warm, a warm welcome to you, Prime Minister, President Duque from Colombia, and the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, we know it's been an extremely uh, busy time for you, uh, Madam President. Uh, certainly no shortage of issues to talk about. And, and in fact, my difficulty has been trying to keep up with so many fast-moving stories. But we, we start our discussions on the theme of recovery. What should guide it? What it should look like? How to frame it to electorates deeply worried about their health, their livelihoods, and about just how much longer uh, the planet we live uh, on can hold out. Uh, President Macron, uh, I am aware that you have to leave us in about 10 minutes or so. So I am going to kick off, if I may, uh, with you and pick up on a couple of uh, 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 points that you made on the multilateralism first up. I, I, I would like to ask you, uh, Mr. President, just how optimistic you feel now that we can get things back on track, uh, given we have uh, someone new uh, in the White House from January 20th. Thank you very much. Look, I, I think... A lot of things depend on us. And for me, the main, the main test on, uh, on multilateralism will be about management of this COVID crisis. Whoever's in charge, if, you, if we manage to cooperate on vaccines, solidarity vis-a-vis -vis emerging country and especially Africa, we will put ourselves in a situation to resume de facto multilateralism. So for me, uh, I would say the first test would be the answer to, to, to COVID-19 crisis around this, I would say, ACTA initiative. The second point is obviously about climate change. Yeah. And this is the second test, how to do vis-a-vis -vis vulnerable countries. Jacinda is perfectly aware of that and, and so committed with us. And I see her. And, uh, and, uh, and de facto, we managed to do our job at the European level. US and China should move in the coming months. If we deliver on, uh, on this way, I think we can have concrete results. So for, for me, I'm reasonably op optimistic if we manage on these two short-term issues with very long-term impact to work closely together. Um, I want to pick up on climate, and, and I promise you I will come to the others shortly. Um, I want to pick up on climate. You, you spoke about this in your address, Mr. President. Can, can you honestly say that you have fully leveled with your populations, any of you, about what's at stake in the climate crisis and the scale of change really needed to address this. We see uh, uh, government leaders standing together with scientific uh, medical officers talking about the pandemic. Uh, when will we see government leaders standing next to climate scientists looking at charts on climate? I think we started with the GIEC and, 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 and a lot of uh, this type of experts and bodies. And, and de facto, we built our European Green Deal on the basis of scientists' approach on these charts. The communication was different because it was not seen as a short-term crisis. And probably collectively, this is, a, this is a mistake. And you're right. We can probably try to embody diff differently um, such a crisis and have a different management. But our strategy, our regional and national level, is definitely based on scientific facts, is worked and built on with academics and so on. So you're right. This is, a, this is de facto how we... Yeah. How, how we work. The question is perhaps how to make it more perceivable by our people. Indeed. Uh, and, and, and finally, um, I, I wonder a, a general question. Are you more heartened, uh, Mr. President, or horrified by the way the world has reacted this year on the downside, uh, national rivalries on vaccines and upsurge in conspiracy theories, fake news? fresh f fuel for the populists. On the upside, of course, we've seen companies pull together on vaccines, uh, governments putting people before fiscal rules, the recovery fund. Um, final thought from you, does the global balance come out net positive 
or negative at the end of all of this, do you think? <laughs> I mean, we will see that in 10 years' time. I would say this kind of crisis is a super accelerator of the best and the worst, for sure. And, and you mentioned that. I think it accelerated a lot of things. Science. I mean, nobody de did imagine that in less than one year time we could inv invent a vaccine against such a virus totally unknown a few months ago. Indeed, inventive cooperation, and especially when I look at the European level and what we delivered collectively mm. with Charles, Ursula, Pedro, and all the other leaders, I mean, nobody expected that. With ACTA, what we launched, now we, we have to deliver. It's not yet done. And on the other side of the picture, you're right. We saw a lot of um, selfishness, a lot of unproductive, I, I would say, uh, uh, comp competition, and this uh, neo-obscurantism with uh, fake news and, yeah. and, uh, and, and all the guys obsessed, obsessed by possible plots and so on. But this is what, where we have to work harder and harder, how to make our social networks more positive and based on facts, how to, to fight all together in a cooperative approach against this hatred speech. And this is what we launched with the um, uh, Christchurch calls, by the way, and it is very important in, the, in such a context. How to work collectively to have more science and common knowledge in order to base our decisions. I mean, all in all, I'm a strong believer that this crisis will accelerate the best. If we work very closely together and if we just try to address the bad and build collective positive answers. Okay. President Macron, many thanks uh, for talking with us. Um, apologies to the others, by the way. I haven't brought you in. The, the, the protocol people will be having words with me, no doubt, afterwards. Um, Pri Prime Minister Arden, let me, let me kick it off with you. Thanks for joining us. You, you, you made a successful sales pitch, for want of a, a better uh, phrase, to your electorate recently. How, how hard is it, uh, Prime Minister, to keep such an increasingly uh, bewildered public, racked by so much uncertainty, on side. What, what resonates most loudly with them? Well, I think, uh, first of all, just ensuring that there isn't bewilderment. Look, there's no question that um, for everyone, there has been no particular rule book for a pandemic of this nature. But I think our populations have appreciated knowing that leaders have shared information as they've seen it. Um, they've openly communicated uh, the questions that we've had to grapple with and chosen a path that resonated with the population. So from New Zealand's perspective, our approach to COVID was a wellbeing approach. Our view was that there was no economy without our people. And when we analyzed the impact of COVID on our population base, it was very clear that elimination strategy was the right approach for us. Now, I acknowledge that it's not necessarily possible for everyone. We have a la rather large moat around New Zealand, so that's enabled us to put in place controls that aren't possible everywhere. But it ultimately was a well-being approach, mm. and it's one that I think um, we have lived to um, feel very pleased about having bought, bought in place. All right. Uh, look, I'll come back to that, uh, Prime Minister. Thank you. Um, uh, President Michel, let me ask you, on the, on the back of what we've just heard from uh, Prime Minister Arden, um, is it an approach, the well-being approach, the happiness index? Is that something that, will, that can work in Europe? Yes, I'm convinced that it's um, really key to, to think uh, what are the possible criteria that we can use at the democratic level in order to demonstrate that we are improving the well-being of the people. And this is the fundamental goal of this European project. Uh, Article 3 of the treaty mentioned this goal, the well-being of the people, the dignity of the people. And I think we should think politically what are the, the criteria that we can consider in order to, to assess year after year are we making more progress? And you know, this uh, crisis is a unique opportunity. It's a big challenge, but it's a unique opportunity in order to, to rethink the way we are working, mm. the way we are taking decisions to together at the collective uh, level. 
And I hope in Europe, and maybe also with the support of organizations such as the OECD, we can try to make some progress. Next year, in Portugal, we'll have an important summit, a social summit. Uh, and the question is how to take into consideration those big, difficult transitions, the digital one, the climate, the climate change, in order to make more progress and to take uh, into consideration for our people uh, those important goals. So just to very quickly follow up on that, you are saying to us that this sort of progressive policy making can work work uh, in Europe can become defining parts of European nations' budgets. Yeah, but look, the, the, the recent months, uh, something really interesting happened in many different countries in Europe, but not only, not only in Europe. When we took the very difficult decisions with regard to the lockdown, it was a clear choice. It was the choice for, for health, for the well-being of the people. It was more important than the economic development. It was a very strong and clear choice politically uh, that, we, that, that we made. And this is an interesting signal, and that's why we think, for example, that uh, the stress of resilience is so important. Mm -hmm. How is it possible to be better prepared at the European level, but more generally at the global level, against the different crises, against the different uh, church, and this is also the translation of our priorities, uh, the question of the fight against inequalities, for example. Mm -hmm. The sustainability uh, is, is another very concrete example, and that's why I think, I hope, that we can uh, make more, more, more progress on all yep. those issues uh, in the next month. Okay, thank you very much indeed, President Michel. Uh, President Duque, uh, if I could bring you in. Colombia, of course, joined the OECD in April of this year. How has accession helped drive, helped inform the way that you're pitching recovery, uh, President Duque, and your country, and, and boosted the momentum for reform? Well, I first of all think that for us to be the 27th member of the OECD represents a big change and a very important instrument for us to accelerate reforms. As you well know, we have already launched a plan, which is the recovery plan for Colombia. And there are three elements that we have been working closely with the OECD. The first is we want a big, back, better, greener. And we have made a clear commitment that we want to reduce our CO2 emissions by 51% for 2030. We have also said that we want to become a carbon neutral country by 2050. And we are now leading the energy transition in Latin America, especially focusing on non-conventional renewables. The second thing is inclusive recovery. And that means that we are going to expand like no other time before the access to free public education. We are now getting to 30% of all the uh, the students in public education being paid by the government, and we'll get to 50% by the end of our term. But at the same time, we're making the largest expansion on water and storage, and we're also reducing social gaps in the rural areas. Hmm. And the other element that is very important is how do we bring this as a gender revolution? And that's how we close the gaps between uh, salary differences between men and women. So we want to make this inclusive. And last but not least is how do we accelerate technology? And that's why in the latest index that was published by the OECD, Colombia became the third country in the world accelerating the digital reform in government and other services. So we see this as an opportunity. And as the OECD well says, better policies for better lives. Mm -hmm. We want to work with the OECD so that all these policies will be accelerated and will be producing a big impact on the Colombian population. Very quickly, President Duque, to follow up on that, we heard Prime Minister Ardern talk about what resonates in her country. What, what resonates in Colombia, um, given the way you need to bring in the informal workforce, given, you mentioned the rural areas and the, the importance of, of providing for the rural areas. What, what, what do these people need from you? Well, I think there are three uh, basic challenges that we have to, uh, to, uh, to face. The first one is informality. Informality in Latin America has been very high. How do we tackle inform informality? We need to have more SMEs. So that's why with this uh, reform program that we have launched and also with the recovery plan, what we want to do is bring more resources and let the SMEs become the drivers of the generating of new employments. The second thing is that in the rural areas, we want to build what we have called the contractual agriculture. And that means that the buyers will connect to the small peasants and they will have a fair contract long term with, a e, with, with the lowest interest rates that yep. we have ever had in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, 
We need to provide them credit and training so that they keep on expanding the uh, agricultural border. With that, we're going to make a big reform in the, in the rural areas. And last but not least is how can we make the big transformation in productivity? And that only comes through education and technology. That's why we have made a big bet on double titling so that when every student graduates from high school, it has in the one hand the high school diploma and in the other hand the technician diploma. So with an initial year of virtual training, he can become a professional. Mm -hmm. But we're going to, he's going to be trained with the right elements to be participant in the fourth industrial revolution. That's why we're working on AI, IoT, cloud computing, so that we give the pertinent training to the students and they can become actors at a starting role in this fourth industrial revolution. All right, President, thank you very much indeed. Uh, President von der Leyen, I, I, look, I, I know you're deep in Brexit negotiations, and I, and I will come back to that, I'm afraid, um, at some point. But the crisis, this crisis has clearly been a catalyst uh, for consensus. Uh, we saw recently on the budget, uh, on climate, to the surprise, I think, of, of many uh, skeptics. I, is uh, this, uh, Madam President, indicative of the sort of progress and consensus to come? Or is that wishful thinking, given the deep underlying rifts that clearly exist among member states? Well, we have seen that uh, the old saying, never waste a crisis, uh, is correct, because um, at the very beginning of the COVID crisis, um, there was a instinctive trend towards uh, inward looking and uh, reacting on the member state level. But we saw very fast that uh, this crisis is too big for any member state or any country at all to overcome it by itself. And then the turnaround was interesting. There was a lot of trust then with, uh, into the European institutions with the task of, uh, we proposed to build up next generation EU with the new budget, which is now 1.8 trillion that will be invested in uh, uh, recovering, but also preparing for the future. And it's fascinating to listen here to the panel. It is these big trends that are now uh, emerging. It is, thanks God, by now, the big trend in getting greener and more sustainable and having the European Green Deal, for example, as our new growth strategy. Yep. It's a huge trend of digitalization. And the topic of resilience is the new one, mainly looking at uh, the health topic. So, um, and these are all topics, no member state is able to manage them on its own, but together as 27, yep. as uh, one united Europe, we have an enormous strength to move forward. Uh, and I will um, come on to the, the, the Green New Deal in just a second, but let, let me get this right though. You are telling us on budget, on climate, the EU 27 are now properly united behind you? They are. Um, this was uh, one of the results of uh, the Council, um, the European Council, but you also see that uh, we are deeply convinced that uh, in, for example, standing up uh, fighting uh, the climate change, we have a responsibility to uh, show leadership, to move forward and um, to show that growth is possible, but a growth that is sustainable and that is clean and that is healthy, and that it's worth to invest in the new technologies because um, this is not only good for the planet, it's not only good for people, but it will also be, there will also be a strong demand over time worldwide to have these new technologies. And if we are able to prove that you can have uh, growth that is sustainable, that is clean, then we are moving a big step forward. All right, thank you very much indeed. President Sanchez, um, we heard this morning that the post-war period gave birth to the Marshall Plan, the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD, ultimately the European Union, public medicine systems in many places. Do we need to be thinking now, do you think, on that scale again? Do we need a new global settlement, a new grand institutional architecture to move us through this? Well, I, th I think so. I think that, uh, as uh, Ursula and Charles said, uh, at the European level, we understood in the beginning of the crisis the need to uh, share uh, not only knowledge, but also to, uh, to be united against this uh, pandemic that doesn't um, understand borders or ideologies or gender issues. So I think that we have to, to, move, uh, to move forward. I think that the um, uh, World Health Organization is uh, an institution that we need to strengthen. 
Uh, also, the OECD it has been uh, very useful and helpful for all of us because uh, we, we found a place uh, where we can get information, uh, share knowledge, uh, see good pa best practices in order to, um, to face different uh, perspective of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I'm a firm believer of, uh, of multilateralism and I think that, um, that uh, it is crucial for all of us to strengthen multilateralism in the years to come. Is, is uh, President Sanchez, is the US firmly back at the table in your mind? <laughs> and, and, how, and, and, and would this year have been easier had uh, Joe Biden been president of the United States? Well, I think, I, think, I mean, I, I didn't understand, and I, I said this uh, publicly many times, I didn't understand this vision of the uh, Trump administration uh, blaming the, the European Union and, uh, um, let's say, um, saying that the European Union is an, an enemy of the United States. Mm. It's the contrary. I'm, I'm firmly believed uh, on, on the trust and like the relation. We were speaking about, uh, about it in the last uh, council, but let me, let me tell you, uh, since uh, Duque is here and the Secretary General comes from, from Mexico, I, th I think that the European Union is also very, very linked to Latin America, and this is uh, a continent, a part of the continent that we need to, uh, let's say, to approach, yeah. uh, especially after after this pandemic and, I, and, and I, the I, social consequences. I, I will pick up on that in, in, in just a moment. Uh, President von der Leyen, very quickly, and I, Prime Minister Arden, I will come back to you. And by the way, feel free to jump in. I want to keep this interactive. Um, uh, President von der Leyen, you talked about uh, renewing and reinvigorating the U.S. relationship. What, what does that mean? What, is, what, what, does that, what does that look like over the next six months? Well, uh, briefly, um, what we know for sure, we are not going to pick up where we left uh, four years ago because the world has changed, the United States have changed, and we have changed. Um, but what I see is that we can start a new transatlantic agenda that is indeed focused on uh, developing together a, a sustainable vision, a fight against climate change, a green vision. Um, to set the standards how we're dealing with technology and mainly digitalization so that we have a human-centered approach to digitalization and mainly AI. Um, so it's not the market who's going to regulate it, it's not the government, but it's a human-centric approach to deal with data. And, of course, then uh, have a look at uh, the resilience of this world um, and the new topic, of course, what other lessons learned from the COVID crisis uh, will shape this common um, transatlantic agenda. Uh, pr pr President Michel, having the U.S. on side how, as an ally on climate, how, how, easier, how much easier will that make things? In the, in the European perspective, it's very important to be, to be totally committed at the diplomatic level in order to support this, uh, this green agenda. And, and indeed, we hope with the new uh, American administration that it will be again possible to work together uh, in order to, to, be, to be ambitious. Uh, this is the same when we have uh, a summit a few weeks ago, for example, with uh, the Chinese authorities. Uh, we are totally committed to the 27 member states in order to encourage a country like China to make more progress on this topic. It's also a question of fairness, and that's why at the trade level, we think it's very al important also to work with a country with, uh, like uh, America, like the United States, the same with Japan, for example, in order to, to try to develop the same common agenda and to consider climate change as an important uh, leverage uh, in order to, to improve our economic relationships. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue with climate in just a sec, but, but you mentioned China. So, Prime Minister Ardern, I, I, I can't really help asking you this. Are you, are you less skittish about the US-China relationship going forward from your perspective? We are, we are not naive. We don't think, yep. we, we don't think with, this, with this new administration in the United States that tomorrow everything will be right. easy between Europe and the United States. But at the same time, we think that we will have a more positive channel of communication, a more positive channel of dialogue, that it will be possible to have a, a better mutual understanding. And about China, we have in Europe a clear vision. Mm. We discussed a lot the recent months at the level of the leaders, the 27 leaders, and we have a united approach. What are our priorities? First, we want to engage with China, especially at the multilateral level, a topic like climate change, health, COVID-19. We think we need to work together. We need to cooperate, point one. Point two, we need to rebalance our relationship with China. We need more reciprocity, we need more clarity, mm -hmm. the state aid regime, for, for example, 
And point three, important in Europe, we, we don't paper over our values, our democratic values, and we don't hesitate to promote our strong uh, 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 democratic values, the, the human rights, etc. Okay, Mich uh, President Michel, thank you. Um, Prime Minister Ardern, um, same, same question to you. I mean, from where, if this is a, a critical relationship for you. Are you less skittish about the US China relationship going forward? Is there, is there, is there, is there reason to be optimistic here? I, I don't think skittish is necessarily, Alex, the word that I would use. You know, we're pragmatic. Uh, yes, we've had a change of leadership in the United States, and that fundamentally, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, lends itself to potentially a different approach. I think we may see uh, a, a slightly less combative uh, approach. However, you know, I don't think we should be so naive to assume that suddenly um, the, the foundation of some of the contested space has fundamentally shifted. I think mm -hmm. that there are still some domestic realities for the United States in the trade area that they may indeed conduct their diplomatic relations in a more predictable way, but some of those underlying issues and tensions I expect may still remain. Yeah, okay. Um, shifting back to climate, you, you recently declared a climate emergency. You've, you, you've, called, uh, you've called them the first steps in your effort to build back better. Um, forgive me, um, with a layperson's hat on here, what, what does the, the emergency framing actually allow you to do that you couldn't before? Um, is, it, is it more symbolic or does it actually translate into faster decarbonisation? And I ask you that because I wonder why others aren't going this way as uh, the UN Secretary General Guterres hopes they will. A number have. You know, we are certainly by no means the first... Uh, nation to do this, a number have. And I think what we are essentially flagging is that, at least in New Zealand, for the most part, climate emer uh, emergency uh, or declarations of uh, emergencies uh, tend to be left to civil defence emergency, um, floods, uh, you know, severe weather events. Uh, what we're flagging here is that actually climate change is inextricably linked with these issues. Mm. They do uh, exacerbate those issues for which we often do declare uh, national emergencies. And so it's acknowledging the urgency of the issue. It is, however, just that, a declaration. We coupled it with a plan around decarbonisation of our public sector, but it also must be attached to a comprehensive approach. We, for instance, are one of those uh, a few privileged countries where the majority of our emissions comes from agriculture, uh, over well over 40%. Uh, the low-hanging fruit of uh, energy generation and transport for us is a bit different than for most nations. So we're really, I think, at the forefront of having to determine how can we be a food-producing nation and yet reduce our emissions at the same time. Mm. So we are very focused on the research and development. We are um, amongst the first nation to commit to pricing uh, our agricultural emissions because we know if we can find our way through uh, on food production and the threat it poses for climate change, then we can demonstrate a path through for other countries where once they deal with their low-hanging fruit, they'll be looking at food production as well. Okay, uh, President Sanchez, um, on, on this issue, you, you uh, among all the others, have talked about a, a, a green uh, recovery. Um, my question is this, though. A focus on, on net zero targets for 2050 is one thing, but, but what about now? You know, what, what about next year? If, if we can, can reconvene a year from now, what can we expect to have done over the, the next 12 months? Well, I think that the most important thing is to, um, uh, that people understand that uh, this ecological transition means jobs, prosperity, um, enterprises, and uh, um, um, let's say opportunities for all. If we, uh, I think it's, it's crucial for all of us to, to, to create a, a, an integrative perspective of the ecological transition. And this is the challenge that we're facing also in Spain, where different territories uh, within Spain are touched by this uh, energetic transition and we have to explain and engage companies in order to uh, create opportunities mm -hmm. in these territories. So um, my, my, my political goal is always uh, explain people that ecological transition, energy transition means jobs, prosperity, economic growth. Are we, uh, President Michel, are we seeing enough uh, from governments 
to prioritize and fund climate-related research and development? What, in terms of the funds, and in terms of tr trying to woo the, 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 the private sector as well, are we seeing enough in this space? The first point is to give a, a clear signal, to, to, to take a clear orientation. At the European level, what we have decided a few months ago and confirmed uh, last week, uh, the fact that we mobilized, that, that we will mobilize uh, 1.8 trillion euros during the next years, this is a, a very strong signal, and 30% at least of this amount will be dedicated to our, uh, to our um, green, green ambitions, point one, point two. I think that we need a new paradigm. I mean, the last decades, uh, we have developed our economies uh, through the exploitation of the natural resources. And now we consider that we need new resources. And for, for example, the circular economy is something which is very important in the future because it means that something which was seen in the past as a, as a waste mm. is, now, is now a product, is now a, a resource. And the same at the, the digital level. The, the, the digital data is the new resource sources on which we need to, to base uh, our, our economic development in the future. It means a totally new approach in comparison with the past. We took very strong decisions in Europe, climate neutrality that we have decided one year ago, and two days ago when we took the decision to, to, uh, to, to uh, increase uh, our common goals uh, by 2030. Hmm. Okay, President Michel, thank you. Uh, President, uh, President Duque, just a, a quick word from you on, on the climate piece. It's clearly a critical issue for you as well, given what what's going on next door, given what's going on with the rainforest. How prepared are you to, to stand up to, 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 to some, some of the climate deniers, some in your, in, in, in your um, close proximity? Well, I think we have to be uh, always based on scientific uh, research. But let me say something very clear. Colombia only represents 0.4% of all the CO2 emissions worldwide. But we're one of the highest uh, vulnerable countries on the effects of climate change. So that's why we have made very clear commitments. We have said we want to reduce CO2 emissions 51% by 2030. We have also said we want to become carbon neutral by 2050. But we have also said two very important things. One is that we're going to pass from 0.2% of our energy matrix based on non-conventional renewables to more than 14% in the next two years. And we have also said that we want to plant 180 million trees by August 2022. We're going to close this year with 50 million trees that have already been planted. And we have called the private sector to participate in a circular economy policy with the idea of producing, conserving, and conserving, producing. And we want all individuals in Colombia to be highly conscious on how to reduce the individual mm -hmm. uh, footprint in terms of CO2 emissions. And that's why we have also concentrated on an education platform that calls the people to use, recycle, reduce, and also to be able to connect every single activity in reducing the individual footprint. With that, I think Colombia wants to play a key role, a leadership role in Latin America. And let me say something. That's why we have also called countries to participate in the protection of the Amazon and high altitude ecosystems, because these are ecosystems that are much needed if we really want to make an important effort to yep. contain climate change effects. All right, thank you very much. Uh, President von der Leyen, uh, uh, the Green New Deal, I said I was going to come back to this. You know, I, I asked President Macron whether, whether leaders, including himself, were doing enough to, to level with, uh, with their electorates about what's really at stake here. Um, I, I talked to President Sanchez about what can be done in the next 12 months rather than look, throwing it ahead uh, uh, some decades. I'd, I'd be interested to hear your response on, on both of those things. Are European countries, not just European countries, many countries around the world, are they doing enough? Are they being honest enough? Are they being clear enough with their electorates about, about what's at stake and the sort of change that really needs to happen pretty much across every sector? A war footing, I think the ICCP called it, uh, uh, is needed. I think we all know that we have to be more ambitious. Um, because this climate crisis is so huge and uh, the time left before we reach tipping points is so short that we all know um, that speeding up and being more ambitious uh, is absolutely necessary. And um, therefore, uh, for example, next year, we are coming with a whole set of new regulations that are detailing out how we're going to reach the goal we've set ourselves 
with a decreasing 55% of uh, CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, we have to really be transparent on uh, exactly measuring also that we are reaching our goals. And uh, here, this is an enormous effort for the whole world. Um, and the time that is left is short. We have a decade, perhaps, mm -hmm. to really improve things. Otherwise, we're reaching tipping points and then a vicious cycle starts. And therefore, everybody has already a, 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 an idea of what is going on if you look at the extreme weather phenomena, for example, the droughts and the floods and the fires. But this is just the beginning and therefore it's urgent. Okay. Uh a couple of other bits and pieces I want to touch on before uh, we, we wrap this up. Um, I've, got to, I've got to ask you a question on Brexit, uh, President von der Leyen. I understand no one wants to be the first to walk away from uh, the table. But realistically, you've been talking for a year now. You've been having the same conversation on the same issues. What, what gives you reason to think that, that, that something can be pulled out of the bag here? Well, first of all, there's movement. That is good. And... Uh, um, the transition period ends. So we're talking about a new beginning with old friends, but we should also be clear from the 1st of January on, and this is in three weeks, the UK will be a third country to the European Union. And what we have sorted out such a package already um, in the agreement, but what is essential now to finalize uh, the one and uh, only important question that is, if the UK wants a seamless access to the single market, and the single market of the European Union is the largest one in the whole world, um, they are welcome. Mm. But uh, they either have to play by our rules, because this is a matter of fairness for our companies in the single market, or the other choice is uh, there is a price on it, and the price is quota and tariffs. But, but and this is what we are just sorting out at the very end. Should we read into this, 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 uh, these prolonged discussions that, that negotiators have not yet exhausted all options? Exactly. We're on the very last mile to go. Uh, but it's an essential one. And we want a level playing field. We want a level playing field not only at the start, but also uh, over time. And this is the architecture we are building. And uh, we are fine about the architecture itself, but the details in it, do they really fit? And these are crucial points because, again, it's a matter of fairness. It's a matter of uh, fair competition. And we want to ensure that. Okay, President von der Leyen, thank you. Look, we're, we're running out of time. I'm, I'm told we've only got a few minutes left. A couple of things I want to finish with. Um, first, uh, and, and Prime Minister Arden, let me, let me put it to you. Are, are, have female leaders been better at rallying their voters to, 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 to combat this pandemic than, than their male counterparts? I know you've been asked this on, on, on a number of occasions. What are your thoughts? Very briefly, and I'd like to hear everyone else's as well. Do you know, I, I don't know how well placed I am to answer that um, question. I, I'd love for us to be in a position where we're instead just analysing different styles of leadership rather than seeing it as, as necessarily gendered. All, all I can say is that I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, I do not have a background in infectious diseases. I've always been willing to humble myself to this role in this position and in doing so, take the advice of experts in the field. And there's been... Uh, no better demonstration of why it's so important for us to listen to a, an evidence base um, than a global pandemic where we literally were learning alongside one another. And so I'd like to think that our approach in New Zealand has been one both where we've been evidence-based, um, but as I said in the beginning, where we also focused on a well-being approach that actually said flattening the curve is not enough for us. Mm. A flattened curve in New Zealand would have meant uh, a, a high mortality rate, and that wasn't tolerable to us. Yep. Okay. So um, maybe that's gendered leadership, <laughs> or maybe that's uh, maybe that's just leadership. Does, does anyone else want to say anything on this? Uh, the President Sajjus. <laughs> Not to put you on I, the spot. I completely agree with, with, with Hathinda. I think that uh, you know to face this uh, this uh, huge challenge with um, humble. You have to be humble. You have to to be transparent in the information. Uh, you have to base uh, your decisions on uh, science. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, try to, to, to build up unity hmm. among political parties, uh, among, of course, uh, society. Uh, okay, uh, President Duque, did you put your... Yeah, please, come on in. 
to say something briefly. At the beginning of the pandemic, what we saw was a lot of demagoguery saying that there was a dilemma between protecting the health system and protecting the population and and uh, vis a vis the economy. I think what we have all seen is that both things have to be on a balance. What we can tell from our experience is that we have been able to work along in expanding the ICU capacity, the testing capacity, the tracing capacity, the isolation capacity, and at the same time, being able to recover the economy in a safe way. We're now in 92% of, of recovery rate. Mm -hmm. And I think we want that to continue. And the only way that this can work along is not just the government making decisions, but also the behavior of the population. And I should say the Colombian people have behaved very well so far, and we want to keep them very much aware that this is not over yet and that we need to keep on recovering with the population being uh, acknowledgeable of social distancing, the usage of masks, and at the same time, avoiding multitudes. All right. Uh, look, I, I, I want to thank all of you. Just, I, I do want to get a final comment from you, Secretary General. We, we've touched on a, a number of issues, a number of issues that we, ha we haven't been able to touch on. But g give us your overall thoughts. And, and, and actually, let me pose it to you with this question. And it's, it's delicate, and, it's, and I have to be diplomatic here. But I, I wonder what it, what it, it says about leadership when, when, when competence, when doing the job is held up uh, as exceptional in these times, or comes across as exceptional in these times. What does that say about leadership? Well, uh, it says that uh, we're not having uh, Ursula today because she's in Brussels, <laughs> uh, because uh, she is going the last mile, you know, going the last mile, and we hope she's going to get a deal. You know? She's... Uh, the, uh, uh, Charles Michel and, uh, and Ursula have uh, done a lot of things in the last few weeks, in the last few months. But of course, uh, this is uh, one very important. Uh, I, I, I have to say, uh, when you're talking about leadership, uh, here you have uh, Jacinda Ardern, who uh, just uh, had the, the, uh, the well-being budget approved, you know. Uh, a budget all based on well-being. Well, that is an initiative. That is something new that is original, but it also she got it done, and, and it's, it's happening. Uh, with with uh, President Duque, we're going to sign uh, a little later in the day, uh, we're going to sign virtually an agreement to support the reform program of uh, Colombia. Again, you know, you're moving in a direction in which uh, you're, you're going to the... Uh, you're, you're going to the reforms as a fundamental question. So reform, reform, reform all the time. Uh, uh, here, um, I want to uh, uh, say that uh, uh, when the world got together, when the Europe got together to deal with a package, with the 750 and the, you know, which part was grants and which part was, that was, for me, uh, looking from the outside and not being European, the single most important moment uh, in terms of uh, European unity and mm. European integration uh, going forward. And here we have uh, Charles, who is, was, was critical about that. And of course, uh, Mr. Uh, Sanchez, President Sanchez, who not only chaired our, um, our uh, ministerial uh, council meeting, but also uh, was uh, uh, the one who has been pushing the question of uh, social protection, social protection, uh, make everything in the guise of not only green, but also uh, more inclusive, hmm. the question of inclusiveness. <coughs> so I would say this is a kind of exercise, together with President Macron, who just left, multilateralism, uh, climate. I would say these are the type of, th this is the leadership that we're following. This is the leadership that we're serving. Secretary General, thank you very much indeed uh, for those clo closing thoughts. Uh, President Duque, uh, Prime Minister Arden, President Michel, uh, President von der Leyen, and President Sanchez. I mean, getting all of you uh, to talk on one panel is a feat in itself. So, I, I, <laughs> given how busy you are, hopefully uh, we've stirred some thoughts. Hopefully we got some news out of this uh, as well. And thanks again to President Macron. I've seen that it's also one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I think, in, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, in one o'clock in the morning in New Zealand. We, so, we, thank we, you very much. We will let we will let you all go now. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed to all of you. Thank you.